Let's get to the book of Revelation. We've got this week and next week, and then uh, this study will be over. Uh, the book of Revelation, you know four things about it? it? Yeah, I hope you do. It is a revelation. It's a revelation to seven churches in Asia, a revelation to seven churches in Asia in signs. It's a revelation to seven churches in Asia in signs of things which must shortly happen. Shortly does not mean, does not uh, mean lonely. We're going to jump right in to chapter 12 and hope that you uh, can remember some of the things that we've studied. Um, the, when the seventh angel sounds, the Bible says in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 10, the mystery of God is finished. What is the mystery of God? That the Jews and the Gentiles are in the same body. As long as Jerusalem exists, as long as the temple is there, there is division. And so when the seventh angel sounds at the end of chapter 11, it's not, it's not atomic bombs and Armageddon and 10,000 other things that, that the, the televangelists would have you believe. The Bible simply says the seventh angel sounded, and here's the key statement, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, the kingdom of Judah was the kingdom of God. And so when the seventh angel sounds, the mystery is finished. And the mystery is that the Gentiles are going to be in the church like the Jews. There should be no difference. There will be one body, not a Jewish body as in the Old Testament and the Gentiles excluded. We will be fellow heirs inside the one body. And so when you get to chapter, uh, chapter 12, and we've already studied this, when Jesus the man-child is born... We look at that chapter, and there's, there's that pregnant woman who's giving birth to, uh, uh, to this child. And the, the pregnant woman, by the way, after giving birth to the child, in the latter part of the chapter, flees into the wilderness, and she's there for 42 or 1260 days or three and a half years. That's an important date because chap, uh, uh, chapter 11 says that is how long Jerusalem was going to be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles. The Bible emphatically says this, that, uh, you know, the outer court is to be trodden underfoot for 42 months. During that 42 months, the women and her children are in the wilderness for three and a half years, 1260 days, being protected by God. The child that was born to that woman is Jesus. And so when he ascends into heaven, and the key word in that chapter is now the kingdom of God has come. It is at the ascension of Jesus that chapter 12 discusses he was born on this earth. Satan tried to destroy him. But when he ascends into heaven, he receives the kingdom. Salvation comes and the kingdom comes. And when that happens, Satan is cast out. He has lost his power hold over mankind through the fear of death. Jesus, Hebrews chapter 2 says, by his death, delivered all mankind from the fear of death. That, and, and, and he destroyed the one that, that uh, had that power, and that is the devil. And so when Jesus ascends into heaven, Satan has lost his trump card. We know the resurrection. In the Old Testament, they struggled to even know if there would be a resurrection. They wanted to believe it, but the Bible says immortality is brought to light in the New Testament, not in the Old Testament. And so when Jesus ascends into heaven, Satan is cast out uh, in that warfare that happens there. What does he do whenever he arrives on this earth? Look at chapter 13. Chapter 13 uh, deals with only the short time that the devil has on this earth. And in chapter 13, the beast of the sea has seven heads. One of them has received a mortal wound. Underline that every time you see it. The Bible just keeps talking about it over and over again. And that beast looks like uh, some of the beasts that are in Daniel 7 that are world kingdoms. Chapter, chapter 13 says that, uh, that that beast has that mortal wound. And then it says that that beast was empowered and it ruled every nation, every tribe. It ruled the world. And Satan arrives on this earth and empowers that beast, giving that beast uh, the power to deceive the world, to blaspheme God. 
and uh, to do all of these things. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus ascends into heaven. Satan comes on this earth, and he, ha he has three allies, the beast of the sea, the beast of the land, mentioned in the last part of this chapter, and, and the woman. And she has not been mentioned at all, but she is the key figure. While she's not been called the woman, she has been mentioned. She is Babylon. She is the great city. We'll talk a lot about that in the latter part of this class. The Bible in chapter 17 will explain about this mortal wound. We're not going to look at that yet. We'll be in chapter 17, but that's found in chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. Uh, he overcomes the saint, the beat to does, and he's given authority, and there's that expression, over every tribe and every tongue uh, and every nation, and all the world worships the beast. What's that all about? Those saints in those seven churches, it, it's a book written to them. What government is being worshipped? There is Caesar worship that's going on. It started with Julius Caesar, and every Caesar, in one way or another, has deity attached to his name. There were temples erected, even in the seven churches, where you could go and worship Augustus, or where you could go and worship uh, the, the goddess Rome. Uh, they understood what that was all about. We have trouble understanding because we're not a part of that history. But, uh, and everybody understands. But there's a second beast, and that beast comes out of the land, and it is the beast that causes individuals to worship the first beast. They, th that beast is given miraculous power to deceive the world. Does not the New Testament talk about lying wonders over and over again in the writings of Paul? Why? Because they were there. They were there in the seven churches of Asia. They had to distinguish between the lying wonders of Satan and the true wonders of God. And uh, it's obvious that God made a real difference in that. Um, who is this beast? The answer is found, if you have wisdom, let him understand the last verse of chapter 13. He has a number, and his number is 666. What, what's that, what does that mean? Roman numerals have numerical values. I think of X being 10, I think of V being 5, and those other new numbers that you know. In the Greek, every Greek letter had a numerical value. And so you could write down your name and in a code tell somebody your code. Graffiti has been found where a young man had written on a wall and it was, it was found by archaeologists that my sweetheart is number uh, 1240. You know, and that's like carving your initials in the tree, DJ plus JK, you know, and, and, and it is, that's a code. JK knows who it is. DJ knows who it is. And, but it's a code. And so here is a coded name. It, it, look at 666. Look at the last verse. It is the number of a man. It's somebody on this earth. Who is it? Those individuals in the seven churches immediately knew who it was. I don't know. I don't need to know or God would have told me. All they had to do was to look around who was persecuting them and add up the numbers and it would jump out at them. Now it is possible to put the name Nero in this, in the, in this but is it Nero? I don't know. Could it not have been some local official in Asia among those seven churches? It could just as likely have been that and far more likely than to be Hitler or Mussolini or, uh, uh, what, let's see, Ronald, ha Ronald Wayne, uh, Ronald, uh, what, 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 well, Reagan, Reagan's middle name, what is it, Ronald what? Ronald has six, na six letters, is, is his name Wilson, Ronald, what? Okay, whatever it is, got six letters in it, and Reagan's got six letters in it, so the beast is, is, is Ronald Reagan. And I told you last week that I fixed up an Excel file that I can make your name equal 666. You let me give the numerical values to your name, and I can make your name equal 666. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what? Wilson. Wilson, okay, Ronald Wilson. Thank you very much. Ronald Wilson, Reagan, six letters in each of them. But that's what individuals have done. Now then, uh, the, the end of that beast, by the way, is, uh, is, is, is mentioned. And that is that it is headed into perdition. And we shall see that uh, 
in this study either this week or next week. In chapter 13, that beast of the land says that if you don't worship the beast, you can either buy or sell or get gain. Those individuals in the seven churches would immediately know what that was. We know by secular history that uh, there were certificates given to individuals who had worshipped Caesars, uh, you know, like a, not a social security card, just a, a, a statement signed by the government official. I have seen this individual worship uh, and the name of the Caesar or offer incense to the name of the Caesar. So if you've got that, you've got, a, uh, you've got a passport to go wherever you want to go. The other aspect of this was the abundance of trade guilds. In Asia, almost every trade had its own trade guild, and each of the trade guilds had their own gods or goddesses. And so for a person to be a member of the trade guild, he had to be a part of the union, where as a part of uh, uh, union meetings, they poured out uh, sacrifices or offered animal sacrifices to the goddess or God who was taking care of that trade union. What's a Christian going to do? I can't be a part of that. I am not going to be a part of that. And if you don't, you can neither buy nor sell nor get gain. We don't understand that. But they understood it because it is a letter to the seven churches in Asia. And I'm glad that that secular evidence has, has come along. I would know that much about it without even knowing what it is. But archaeologists have given us some insight by finding and by discovering some of these uh, some of these certificates that uh, that have that have been uh, put that that have been put out. Uh, I, I guess that, that that that's the most of chapter thirteen. Uh, the devil only has a short time. The, let me look it down at my notes and uh, near the bottom part. These churches meet and knew what the mark was. No way to work unless the trade yields, and each of them worship their own idols. And number six six six. We understand Roman numerals have a value. Um, every Greek letter has a numerical value, and it represents a code. Uh, my sweetheart is 1240, so the code is the code number of the beast. I don't need to know. I can guess, but my guess, if I told you exactly who I believe it is, you still wouldn't have any assurance that who, that's who it was. You know, there, There's no need for me to know. I know what that 666 is. It is the number of a man. It's not your social security, you know, being tattooed in your forehead or something like that. You know, it, it's not, uh, you know, it, it, it's not all of the things to tell evangelists. Let's get to chapter 14. This is where we're starting today. When we, I want to go through four chapters. Fasten your seatbelts. When you get to chapter 14, you're introduced again to the 144,000. They are this time before the throne of God, and they are singing the praises of God. That's in the first six verses of chapter 14. Now, when you get, get seeing these individuals singing the praises of God and, and uh, the new song that nobody could learn except those who, who understood it, uh, you probably would have understood it because our spiritual songs are only songs that you and I understand, and pagans don't have an idea when we're talking about uh, the old rugged cross or some of the songs that we sing. And so the world could not know that song because they, they did not know the Jesus of the Bible. The first angel in chapter 14 flies through heaven with the eternal gospel to proclaim that gospel to every tribe, nation, and language, and people. And, and that first angel says, Fear God who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Remember when the trumpets were sounded back uh, in uh, when the seal when uh, uh, the trumpets were sounded back in chapters what uh, uh, seven and eight and nine over in the, over in that area it's probably eight and nine the first first thing that was impacted was uh, was the earth and the vegetation the second thing was the sea the third thing was the fresh water and the fourth thing were the heavenly bodies and this verse says you need to worship God He is in charge of all of these things. And he is pouring out his judgments on these things that he has created. You need to recognize that because those readers in the seven churches of Asia would immediately look and say, oh yeah, he's already talked about that in this book. Whenever God in chapter 8 is sending the plagues on all of these things that are there and these four entities are there. When that happens, a second angel flies or is mentioned 
and he shouts out, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is the past tense. Uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, Babylon is mentioned 295 times in the Bible, but six times in the book of Revelation. And Babylon is the harlot, that, with the woman that we're going to notice in chapter 17. You'll have to wait till we get there to understand. There are four enemies. There's the devil. There's the beast of the sea, the beast of the land. And then there is this fourth element, and that is, that is, that is this harlot. And she is Babylon. Guess what? Babylon is the great city where Christ was crucified. How do you know that, Dan? That's what chapter 11, verse 8 says. And you've got to understand that when the Bible talks about Babylon, it is where Christ was crucified. What, what about ancient Babylon? Ancient Babylon was, de, was, uh, de, uh, was destroyed uh, whenever the Medes and the Persians came. They tore down the walls. You remember the handwriting on the wall when the, when the Syri uh, Syrian army came in? They decimated. They destroyed Babylon. And Isaiah chapter 13, or chapter 14, chapter 14 says, chapter 13 says, it will never be inhabited. Babylon fades out of the picture in, uh, you know, in 535 B.C. There is no more Babylon. But Babylon is continued to be, to be mentioned again. Why? Because this book is a revelation to seven churches in Asia in signs. What's one of the signs? It's Babylon. The Romans wouldn't have a clue when they read this. Pagans wouldn't have an understanding of what this is all. But you and I would understand it because Babylon is where the Lord was crucified. And so the statement is, the great day of his wrath has come, and it is here. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's in the past tense. And Babylon is the great city where the Lord, where the Lord was crucified. A third angel flies through heaven. And I know we're having to go in a hurry, but John saw these in a hurry also. He sees this angel fly through. The gospel is going to be preached to all the world, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, Every, every person on this earth is, is going to hear the gospel. And it flies through heaven. The second angel says, don't worry about Babylon. Don't worry about Babylon. And when the third angel, fly, his message is a message to those who worship the beast and have the mark of the beast, they will drink, look at this, the full measure of God's wrath and specifically mentions fire and brimstone. That's figurative. Don't look for God to rain down fire and brimstone. How do I know it's figured? Because it's a revelation to seven churches in Asia in symbols. And so the, you know, the, the fire and brimstone here cannot, you know, is in a book that is symbolic. What does it symbolize? God is angry at what happened in Sodom, and God is angry at what's happening in Jerusalem. Guess what chapter 11 verse 7 says? That figuratively... Jerusalem is Sodom. No wonder he mentioned fire and brimstone. The wrath of God that destroyed ancient Sodom, and it was no, no, no more, is going to destroy modern Sodom, uh, Jerusalem, where the Lord was crucified. That's chapter 11, verse 7 and 8. You guys, if you're going to understand this book, you've got to circle that over there in there. You will never understand this book until you let the Bible identify who, uh, who this individual is. And they are tormented forever and ever, and there is no rest for them. They are not. For whom? For those who are worshiping the beast. It's happening all over Asia, and Asia, get ready. The wrath of God is coming not just on Jerusalem. You're going to taste of the wrath of God by the plagues of God that God is about ready to be, about ready to be poured out. Then, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, let's, let's see, uh, well, the, the, uh, I put down here the blessed rest of the Christians. After talking about their tormented day and night, chapter 14, verse 13 says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Who's that? That's the martyrs. That's, that's the immediate application of it. You make it a lot wider than that if you want to, and I do, because we are blessed if we die in the Lord and we have rest that awaits us. What a rest the, awaits the wicked? The torment of hell, and, and there is rest for those who are wicked. 
John sees in the latter part of this chapter a one who is like the Son of Man. And he has a sickle in his hand. You know what a sickle is? It's where you harvest the grain. He takes that sickle and he swings it through the earth and the earth is reaped. When I first read this years ago, I thought this is the final judgment. Oh no, this is not the end of the world. This is another judgment. And this is not a judgment of the wicked. You've got to understand this. The wicked are judged by that second angel that is there, uh, that where he harvests the earth and he throws these individuals, those who worship the beast, into the winepress of the wrath of God. Saints in these seven churches, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare worship the beast, even though you cannot buy or sell or get, get gain. The day is coming in which those who worship the beast will taste the full measure of the wrath of God. And when they're put in the wine press of God, guess how much, guess what comes out of that wine press? You might want to circle the word blood there. And the blood that comes out of that wine press is up to the horse's bridle. How, how high is that? Well, stand beside a horse and understand where that bridle is. And it's two, and it is that depth for the, the entire length of Palestine for 200 miles. God is angry. They killed his son and they killed all of the prophets and the great day of his wrath has come. What about the saints? When you see Jerusalem encompassed about with army, get out of the city. Get out of the city. Why? Because God is trying to keep you from being hurt. When the Bible in Matthew chapter 3 talks about Jesus gathering the wheat into his garner, but burning up the chaff, there is that kind of harvest that will be at the end of the world. Not denying that at all. But in the book of Revelation, there is the assurance to these individuals in these seven churches in Asia that you are going to be able to be protected from the outpouring, outpouring of the wrath of God. Now then, when we get to chapter 15, I guess that's, I'm, th I'm through with chapter, chapter 14. I believe that's the last thing. Yes, the blood, blood going for 200 miles. In chapter 15, the, John sees seven angels with the seven final plagues. These plagues are about to be poured out upon the earth and vegetation, on the, on the sea, on the fresh water, and upon the heavenly bodies. When in, cha when in chapters 8 and 9 they're poured out, it's only on one third. Now it is the full measure of the wrath of God. Jesus says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilences before A.D. 70, he says, these are the beginning of sorrow. And so the things that are transpiring as signs for the destruction of that city are only the beginning of the sorrow. And now the fullness of the wrath of God. He sees those, John sees those in, in uh, chapter 15, who have gained the victory. Guess what that word is there? Overcome. What's this book about? To him that overcomes, I will give. Overcome, 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 overcome. Now then, these saints are trying to stay hanging there and to overcome. And now John sees the state of those who have won the victory. These are the ones who have overcome. They have, had, they have the victory over the beast. They've not fallen down to worship the beast and become subjects of the beast, nor of his name, nor of his, or, 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 or of his, na of his number. And they are singing the song of Moses. The song of Moses, listen, is not. The song of Moses is not the song that was sung when they crossed the Red Sea. Open your Bible real hurriedly to, to, the, to the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, in, the, in chapters uh, 31, uh, you, you read... Uh, uh, yeah, well, I guess it's chapter 32. No, it's in chapter 31. Chapter 31, starting in verse 19. 
write down this song to yourself. God tells Moses to do that. Verse 21, then it shall be when many evils and troubles come upon you, sing this song. Uh, verse uh, 28, gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words of this song in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. Verse 30, Moses spoke to the hearing of all Israel and chapter 32 are the words of this song. When you get to the end of this in chapter 32, look at verse 44. Moses came with Joshua, the son of Nun, and spoke all the words of this song. Chapters 46, set your heart on all the words which I testify to you. I wish we had time to read the words of this song. There are three parts to, uh, uh, to this song. The first stanza, and I'm in chapter 32, and that is the first four verses is how great God is. The second stanza starts in chapter 5, or verse 5, and goes through verse 18, that Israel is corrupt. They entered the promised land, and they turned immediately to idols. That's the song they were to sing. They were to teach this song to their children. God is great. God delivered us out of Egypt. And when we got in the promised land, God, uh, uh, we turned to, our, uh, turned to idols. Starting in verse 19, the third stanza is, because of what we have done, the wrath and the vengeance of God has resulted and the Jews will be rejected. The Old Testament foretold the rejection of the Jews so that the Gentiles might come in. Look at verse 43. And oh, how I wish I had time to read the entire psalm. But look at verse 43. When you get to the last refrain of this song, here it is. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and for his people. Gentiles, rejoice you're going to be his people. He is rejecting Judaism. And it's prophesied in the song of Moses. And they're singing it in heaven that, that God, they rejected God and God rejected, rejected in them. Uh, the, uh, 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 well, we got the song of Moses. Let's look at chapter 16 of, 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 the, of the book of Revelation. When you get to Revelation chapter 16, you have the seven final bowls of the wrath of God poured out in full measure. Back in 8 and 9, it was one-third of the earth and the sea and the fresh waters and the heavenly bodies. It is now the fullness of the pouring out of the wrath of God. We don't, we'll not read every one of those, uh, but you can, you can read it yourself. The fullness of His wrath has come. After the third bowl of his wrath uh, is poured out, uh, there is a, 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 a statement that says, uh, let me go. the third bowl, you are righteous, they have shed the blood of the saints, and now they will be drinking blood. That is happening as these plagues are coming out on the world you're righteous for doing this. It's all right for you to torment those who have tormented and killed the saints. That is what this book is all about. When the sixth angel is poured, uh, uh, well, the fifth bowl is poured out on the beast, and there's darkness and there's no repentance, but the beast continues to blaspheme God until the fullness of the coming of the wrath of God on the beast, and we'll talk about that when it comes. When we get to chapters 19, they just continue to blaspheme God. The sixth angel uh, pours out his bowl on the river Euphrates. And coming out of that are three frogs representing the king, they go, that go to the kings of the earth to bring them to the battle day of the God Almighty. He brings them to Armageddon. Armageddon is a geographical place. It represents... In Jewish history, what, uh, uh, what the Alamo means to Texans. It represents in, uh, in, in Jewish history what uh, uh, Pearl Harbor represents to Americans. 
Iwo Jima, Porkchop Hill, uh, Malai or Mylai, is that how you say the Vietnam situation? Uh, 9 11. What happened at Armageddon? All the way through the Old Testament, there is a conflict between God and evil, between the righteous and the wicked. And over and over again, guess what, what happens? The righteous win the battle. And that's what this is. It's not, well, they're always gonna, there's a little valley up there, you know, that's 15 miles uh, uh, wide, perhaps that wide, and maybe 20 miles long, and they're going to bring 200 million horses right up into that valley. They're going to, the, the Soviet army is going to bring its army there. The Muslims are going to bring their armies there. And we're going to have the battle of Armageddon. No, it's not a literal battle. It is the outpouring of the wrath of God whenever these kings are brought down to be a part of God bringing judgment on evil people. And that is on the Jewish nation. That's what Armageddon is. It's a figurative use of it. And you'd be amazed uh, how often in the Old Testament had time we could look at all of those times, all of those, but we simply uh, uh, do not have time. It's difficult to, uh, to cover the book of Revelation in a, in a rapid way. Uh, this gathering is relating to the coming of Jesus. Look, at, look in chapter 16, verse 15. In my Bible, it's in red letters. Jesus says, I am coming. I'm coming like a thief. And what's he talking about? He's talking about when Jesus brings judgment on Jerusalem. God came in the Old Testament, chapter 19, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 19. He came, into a, came in a cloud in the Old Testament. He came in a cloud in the Old Testament. The seventh bowl is poured out and a voice says, it's completed. What is completed? The mystery of God is now complete. The Jews and Gentiles are in the same body. That's what this book is all about. And uh, that's why when the seventh angel begins to sound, the mystery of God is finished. And Ephesians 3 said, that is when uh, the, the, the Jews and Gentiles were equal inside the one body. There are physical manifestations when that seventh um, uh, bowl is poured out. Babylon's evil deeds are remembered by God. God remembers all of the saints and he remembers all of the apostles. And by the way, by the time this book is written, secular history is, is right, 11 of the 12 apostles have been martyred. How's God feel about that? He remembers it and he gives to her the cup of his fierce wrath. That's what chapter 16 is all about. The description of the fall of Babylon is found in chapter 17 and 18. We've got 12 minutes to cover 17 and 18. Fasten your seatbelts. There are four enemies in the book of Revelation. We keep repeating this, hoping that you'll get it. Beast, there's the dragon, beast of the sea, beast of the land, and this harlot, this woman that is about to be introduced. What do we know about this woman. We know that she is the object of God's judgment and she's riding on a beast, a scarlet beast. You remember what color the, the dragon was? A scarlet beast. And this beast has seven heads and ten horns. Isn't that amazing? Remember, one of the horns has received a mortal wound. And she is drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. I want you to look at this. Is hussy a good word? I want you to look at this hussy and how she's dressed and everything. And she's got a cup in her hand. And guess what she's drinking? Not champagne. She's drinking down the blood of the saints. It's figurative. And she is drunk on the blood of the saints. At the end of this chapter we will discover that the ten horns turn against the woman. They are a part of the beast, and they turn against the woman, and that beast destroys the woman. Who is the woman? Well, who, is, who on earth is drunk with the blood of the saints? 
You think it's got to be all of the Jews. Jesus says, you, you know, uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest those that are sent unto thee, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on this earth. You've killed all of the saints and you've killed the apostles. And the Bible says, and the beast is going to destroy the woman. You know when that happened? In A.D. 70, when that beast, the Roman government, came down against the city of Jerusalem and brought the worst tribulation there's ever been on this earth. If you want to understand the wrath of God, read that part of Josephus when he described the tribulation where they're eating their own children and they're, they're eating every varmint there is in the cities. They're chewing on their leather boots. They, uh, uh, they're, they're eating uh, the, the refuse, the, the, uh, the manure of animals, and uh, they're dying. In fact, in that worst tribulation, 1.1 million Jews died. You're talking about a holocaust. We're talking about in just a four or five months period of time, 1.1 million Jews. They tore the Romans, tore the wall down. Guess what? Overnight, the Jews rebuilt the, body, rebuilt the walls using human bodies. Guess what the Romans did? They started crucifying people. And they crucified so many people, they ran out of wood or ran out of a place to put the wood. The message got out. The Jews, are, the people are swallowing their jewelry. So in one night... Those Jews who were fleeing the city, it's too late now. You should have left when the Roman army came down. They're fleeing the city. They literally, alive, disembowel 500 Jews to see what's in their stomach and in their guts. It's the worst tribulation. When we talk about the wrath of God, we've got to understand what we're, what we're talking about in the worst tribulation. Now then, when you get, after the woman is introduced, all of a sudden in verse 7, the angel says, why do you marvel? I'll tell you the meaning of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. That beast that you saw has seven heads, and the seven heads are seven mountains. They are seven kings that are part of this Roman government. And five have already died. Who are... The se who are the seven, the, the five Caesars are Julius, Augustus, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Five have fallen. This right here sets the very date of the book. It's after the death of Nero and before the destruction of Jerusalem. Nero died about the year 68. By the way, when he died, there's turmoil in Jerusalem because there's no one able to succeed him. In a two-year period of time, there are three different individuals who pretend to be Caesars and none of them is able to have it. It looks like Rome is dead. Fatal wound. One of the heads dies and it's fatal to the beast. But it doesn't happen. There is the sixth head. And after the five is, and one is, and one is to come, the sixth one is Vespasian. Guess who Vespasian is? He is the Roman general that Nero sent to destroy Jerusalem. When, when, when he has come down there, and by the way, from the time he landed in the northern part of, Jude, of Galilee until the city was destroyed is 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. Historical fact. They're going to trot under the city, the holy city, for 42 months. And one is, that's Vespasian. When Nero dies, Nero pulls back because there's a tempted revolution down in the land of Egypt. He goes down to Egypt. And finally, just to salvage and to save the Roman government, Vespasian goes to Rome and becomes the sixth of the seven Caesars that are there. Well, what happens to Jerusalem? His own son is left behind. And Titus, the seventh head, is the one who destroys the city. And then he says, but Rome is not dead. There is an eighth. There, there are other Romans. There are, there are others that are, are, are coming along. 
And uh, the beast is the eighth, and this beast is headed for the perdition of God. The ten horns, the Bible says there are kings who joined Vespasian and Titus to destroy Jerusalem, and this is Armageddon. They've come. The woman is the great city, and the Bible says in the last uh, verse of this chapter, the woman you saw is the great city which has a kingdom over all of the kingdoms of this world. They were God's chosen people. Now, I know the King James says reigns, but the word reign is not here in the Greek. It has a kingdom over, better than all of the others, the kingdoms of this world. Chapter 18, the woman falls. Babylon is fallen. As she begins to fall, in chapter 18, uh, uh, she has led the world away from God. She's reaping what she sowed. She was once married to God. She says, I still am. I'm not a widow. You have to read, read the text to see all of this. But she had such a power in the world that when she, when, when she fell, the whole world is upset because the, the commerce of the world uh, is destroyed. And so her plagues come in one day. And when the plagues come, the kings weep. Verse 18, uh, uh, the merchants weep, uh, verse 11, and the shipmasters weep, verse 17. I think verse 18 is the wrong number. But all of the world is at torment, and what are they saying? Woe, 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 the great city, the great city, the great city, the great city, the great city has fallen. Over and over in this chapter, see it, the great city, the great city, the great city. What is the great city? Chapter 11, verse 8, it is where Christ was crucified. And when Jerusalem falls, look at chapter 18, verse 20, rejoice over her, over the harlot, over Babylon, over this woman, O heavens, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. This book opens with people saying, how long will it be? And the Lord says, in just a short time, he will avenge the blood of, of, of those who have killed you. And when you get to chapter 18, verse 20, when Babylon falls, when the great city where our Lord was crucified falls, God has avenged you on her. And in verse 24, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all that were dwelt on this earth. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 34 and 35, up on the city of Jerusalem will come all the righteous blood shed on this earth. If you want to understand this book, look at the parallel in thought between uh, 1820, 1824 in the book of Revelation and Matthew 23, verse 34 and 35. You've got to understand, God brought vengeance on Jerusalem for killing all of the prophets, and that's what this book is all about. Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem is, is, is fallen. Uh, ten times in the book of Revelation you find the expression of the great city. And we read through here and never even notice it. That's why when the Bible says the great city is where the Lord was crucified. Angel takes the stone in the vision, throws a millstone that sinks in the ocean and is out of sight. And, and, the, and the Lord says, and that's what's going to happen to this great city. God has avenged you on her uh, the first enemy has been conquered. The four enemies, beast of the sea, beast of the land, uh, uh, the dragon, beast of the sea, beast of the land, and the woman, and the woman is destroyed. What does that leave? It leaves the beast of the sea and the beast of the land. And next week, in chapters 19, we're going to see the rider on the white horse with the sword going out of his mouth, conquering the world and destroying the beast, both of them. And they're cast into a lake of fire and brimstone. That only leaves the devil. Guess what chapter 20 is all about? It is the fact that the devil is bound. He's ruined Satan, and Satan is bound and he'll be bound for a thousand years. Is that literal or figurative? Those saints in those seven churches would have no way of knowing until the year 1001. We're way past a little thousand years. 
And so like the word thousand, we'll point this out when we get to chapter 20, it's a figurative use all the way through the Bible to talk about the Lord's merciful for a thousand generations. The cattle of a thousand hills belong to the Lord. The, great, the souls have cried out saying, Lord, avenge us. And when you get to chapters 18, he's avenged her. Chapters 19, he's going to avenge the beast and the, and the beast of the sea and the beast of the land. And chapter 20, he's going to avenge the devil. That's where we're headed next week. Thank you very much.